सर्वोपनिषदो गावो दुग्धागोपाल नंदन पार्थोवत्स सुधीर्भोक्ता दुग्ध गीतामृत महद Thank you again everyone for joining us in this Srimad Bhagavad Gita lecture series. This is the second lecture in the lecture series. In the first lecture we learned about the war that was happening inside of Arjun, the conflict, and how he turned that war, that vishad into vishad yog. In our own lives, we all have some conflict, whether it be with a person, a place, or even our own identity, something is at war within us. Now the more we can empathize with Arjun the more we'll be able to grasp Krishna Bhagwan's guidance from the Bhagavad Gita. So every day don't just think that we're at a physical war. Try to find out where you are at conflict with someone else, with something else. And if not with someone externally then internally, how are you at conflict with yourself? The more we can relate to Arjun, empathize with him, the more we'll be able to imbibe the guidance of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. At the beginning of chapter 2 Until now Arjun has laid out dozens of reasons why he doesn't want to fight in the war. He's on his knees, he's sweating, his mouth is dry, his skin is burning, he can't stand up. And Krishna Bhagwan looks at him. He laughs. But Krishna Bhagwan sees more than just his physical body. Krishna Bhagwan doesn't just see the symptoms. He can see into his heart to the root of the disease. He sees that Arjun has more. Krupaya paraya vishto. Vishidan idam abravit. Everything he's telling me, he's telling me from this place, while he's being infatuated from a place of distress. For us, if we saw Arjun in this pitiful state, we would think that he's just dehydrated. All he needs is a glass of orange juice because he can't stand up. His mouth is dry. His skin is burning. He must have low blood sugar. He's dehydrated. If we give him a glass of juice, he'll be fine. Now that's what we see, because we can only see his physical body. But Bhagwan can see beyond that. And in the first couplet, the first shlok of the chapter, second chapter, he says, "Tam tatha krupaya vishtam ashru purna kulekshanam." Even though his eyes are full of tears, he can see the infatuation. He can see the mo. He can see the distress that's lying underneath all of it. And from this, we understand a very important lesson that whenever we have a problem, don't treat the symptoms. Instead, treat the disease. There's a book by the author Randy Posh and the book is called The Last Lecture. It's based on an idea at Carnegie Mellon University. Every year the university selects one of its professors to imagine that this was their last life on earth, last year on earth. And in your last year, what advice would you give your students? One year by chance they selected Randy Posh to imagine that it was his last life, last year on earth and to feel that he was going to give his last lecture to his students. After being given this opportunity to speak in front of his students, some time later he was actually diagnosed with cancer. And so what he was supposed to merely visualize was actually going to happen to him. The university offered. They said you don't have to give this lecture, but he felt that no, now it's actually happening in my life. I want to give this lecture from a place of absolute truth. And in his book, based on his lecture, one of the chapters is called Treat the Disease, Not the Symptoms. He gives an example from his own life. A fellow professor who he was working with, she must have slipped into some debt. And because of the debt, she also had depression, frustration, tension, stress. To alleviate her stress, she started taking classes in yogasam and pranayam, deep breathing, meditation. Those classes helped alleviate the stress. And over time, those classes did have a positive impact on her life. She was speaking about these classes to her to Randy Posh. And Professor Posh said, "How much do you pay for the classes?" She explained, "This is how much money I pay for these regular classes." Professor Posh said, "How much debt are you in?" "This is how much debt I'm in." And then Posh said, "If you do the math, if you stop these classes, you save this much money. And in place of these classes, if you took on a small second job, you would earn this much money. And in this period of time, you would actually earn all the money you need to pay off all the debt you have." and actually get rid of the actual cause of your stress and frustration what we do in our lives if we have a problem at home our typical solution isn't to solve the problem instead is to distract ourselves from the problem and watch a movie instead if we want 2 hours of happiness we watch a movie 
If we want two days of happiness, we'll go on a short vacation. But we don't realize that when we come home, the problem is still waiting for us there. We can't run from our problems. By treating the symptoms and not treating the disease, all we're doing is putting band-aids. But we're not actually getting to the situation and the root of it. Krishna Bhagavan sees the symptoms, but he doesn't treat them. He goes deeper and he sees the despair and he realizes that this is my opportunity to cure him of despair forever, to bring him out of this place. These are two people who are living the same life and having the same external experience. Krishna and Arjun, they're related. And every reason Arjun has not to fight the war is every single reason Krishna has not to fight the war. Everyone has the same family members on the opposite side. So just as many of Arjun's family members who are going to die are just as many of Krishna's family members who are going to die. And yet one is crying and one is laughing. That's the difference. That's what the Bhagavad Gita teaches us. Right now in life we may be crying, but we can get to the place where in the same situation we can laugh at it. Krishna Bhagavan sees Arjun in this pitiful state and the first thing he tells him, he says, Klebya masma gamaha partha padyate that you in this pitiful state, it does not befit you. What you're doing right now, it doesn't look good on you. Get up. Uttishta parantapa. Swami Vivekananda says that this one part can actually be considered the most important part of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. This doesn't look good on you. This doesn't befit you. One thought about where I stand in society, where I stand as a person amongst my family, where I stand as a person in Hindu dharma, who I am, that sense of identity. If we have a good, strong sense of identity, then we'll automatically know what to do, what not to do. Many years ago, Pramukh Swami Maharaj was traveling through North America and he met a devotee who was a Vaishnav. When he met that Vaishnav, Pramukh Swami Maharaj, in a natural way, asked him, do you wear a kanthi, uh, two strings of tulsi around your neck to represent your Vaishnav faith? The devotee said, no, I don't wear that, but I won't wear one from your hand either because I am a strict Vaishnav. Pramukh Swami Maharaj said, I'm not trying to force you to wear one from my hand, I'm just asking. And then Pramukh Swami Maharaj asked a follow-up question. He said, you've been living in America for many years now and you're a staunch Vaishnav devotee. Do you drink alcohol? Do you eat meat? Do you smoke anything? Because it's natural that in India you might be following all of these rules of dharma. But when you go to a faraway country, and there's nobody here, the community is such where it's not frowned upon, you may have slipped. The man looked down and then he whispered a little quietly to Pramukh Swami, he said, yes, I do all of those things you said before. I now eat meat, I drink, I smoke, I do everything on different occasions. Pramukh Swami Maharaj said, when I, a sadhu from India, offered to give you a kanti, at that moment you remembered I'm a Vaishnav. But when somebody else offers you a glass of wine, at that time you can't remember who I am? When you lose that sense of identity, that's when everything else slips away. Whenever you have a question, can I do this or not? Ask yourself, who am I? And does this befit me? Swami Vivekananda says, there must be a very strong personal relationship between these two people that Krishna Bhagwan can tell Arjun this, that you don't look good like this. This doesn't befit you. And then he tells him, get up, Uttishta Parantapa. He calls him Parantapa, that you are the defeater of enemies. In this pitiful state, Krishna Bhagavan can still see that you are actually truly strong. You are brave. You are capable. Krishna Bhagavan, throughout the entire Gita, is always going to say words of enthusiasm to Arjun. The word Gita is used for many different aspects of many different scriptures throughout Hindu Dharma. In the Ramayana, there's the Lakshman Gita, Kak Bhushundi Gita, in the Bhagavat, there's the Udav Gita, a Gopika Gita. In the Swaminarayan Sampraday, we have the Sati Gita, Yogi Gita. What does the term Gita mean? Gita, in a grammatical way, in the dictionary definition, all it means is something that's sung. It's a song. But in a more spiritual way, Gita, Gita are the words that help us stand back up when we've lost, when we're down and out. When we feel like we can't go on any further, when we feel like giving up, those words that help us get back up, those words that help us continue to fight, those words that make us stronger, that's a Gita. Krishna Bhagavan is going to give Arjuna Gita here. These are God's words. 
throughout all of the lectures, we're going to constantly refer back to this point. What we hear is incredibly important. In 1982, one of our senior Swamis of the Swaminarayan Sampraday, Swayam Prakash Swami, also known lovingly as Dr. Swami, he was traveling in North America. He met a person who had lost his son recently in an accident. And the loss of his own son hurt so much on that person that for months he had stopped going to any temple. He had lost all faith in God. And by chance, he came into contact with Swayam Prakash Swami. Swayam Prakash Swami went to his house. And when he was trying to speak to him, this person was not having it. Now, satsang, if I had to give it an example, satsang is like an auto repair garage. Sometimes when there are smaller problems, smaller swamis like myself, we can be the mechanics and we can do an oil change. We can fix something small. But when the problem is bigger, you need experts. You need experts like Swayam Prakash Swami, like Dr. Swami. But when the problem is even bigger than that, then you have to go to the president of the company. Dr. Swami told the, the devotee, he said, you're not listening to anything I have to say, but I have a request for you. Can I make a phone call? He said, yes. Who do you want to call? I need to call India. Is that okay? The person eased up a bit. He's like, you're at my house and you need to call India. Who do you need to call? He said, I want to call Pramukh Swami Maharaj. And Dr. Swami called Pramukh Swami Maharaj. He explained the situation. And Pramukh Swami Maharaj spoke to the devotee for just two to three minutes. And in that small discourse, he explained to him what life is really like and why he should continue his fight, not give up because he lost his son, and do live another good life, continue to live his life in honor of his son. When the devotee put the phone down, he folded his hands to Dr. Swami and he said that if Pramukh Swami Maharaj had not spent those two minutes talking to me, me and my wife had already decided that on XYZ date we were going to commit suicide. They had given up on life entirely. Pramukh Swami Maharaj spoke to them for two minutes. He gave them a Gita, a personal Gita. And in two minutes, he gave them the energy they needed to fight against life again and to continue. That's what the Gita does. Krishna Bhagwan tells Arjun, Uttishta Parantapa. He's shaking Arjun with his words. And Arjun then looks up to Krishna Bhagwan. And in the second, cup, uh, second chapter, seventh couplet, Arjun looks to Krishna and he says, Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava. This is perhaps one of the most important couplets throughout the entire Bhagavad Gita. The second chapter, seventh couplet, seventh shlok. Arjuna is telling Krishna Bhagavan, I accept what you've told me. The spiritually, emotionally, I have completely lost everything I have. Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava. Pruchami tvam. So I'm asking you, just you, because I don't know what to do. Dharma samurda cheta. Tell me what's good for me. Yatshreya. Syan nishchitam bruhitan me. Shishyas teham. I am your disciple. Shadi mam tvam prapannam. Guide me. In four lines, Arjun takes Sharanagati, refuge of Krishna Bhagwan. In the first line, Karpanya Dosho Pahata Swabhava, he accepts the flaw that Bhagwan tells him. Bhagwan says, You've become weak spiritually, emotionally. Arjun doesn't deny it. He doesn't try to justify himself. Well, you would do anything in this situation. You're saying anything, and anyone would have this. No excuses. He accepts it. This is a very important thing. Whenever we go to God, whenever we go to our Guru, quite often they may show us our faults. And when they show us our faults, instead of arguing back, trying to justify ourselves, if we accept our faults, if we confess our sins, then we can move on to the next step. Arjun isn't the best person in the war. Let's remember, he's not the most moral. That's Yudhishthir. He's not the most ethical. That again is Yudhishthir. He's not the strongest. That's Bhim. He's not the smartest. That's Sadev. He's not the ha most handsome. That's Nakul. Everyone has something better. He's not even the best archer. That's Ekalavya. But the saving grace for Arjun is that no matter what problem he has in his life, he confesses his problems, he goes right to God. Pruchami Tvam, one person, I'm asking you, I'm not asking anyone else. He could have asked his family for guidance at this time. Now, had he asked them, they would have done whatever they could to help Arjun. But there's a difference here. When we go to our loved ones, it's not that they don't want to help us, but the problem is they don't know how to help us. There's an anecdote to explain this a little better. There was a man who bought a new pair of pants 
And when he bought them, he thought to himself that tomorrow morning I have to catch an early flight for a business meeting. I want to wear these pants on that flight. But the pants are two inches too long at the bottom. He went home and he saw his wife making dinner that day. He went to his wife while she was making dinner and he told her that I've got these pants. I want to wear them tomorrow to my business meeting. I have an early flight. If you can trim two inches off the bottom, then it would be great. His wife didn't give him much of a response. He went to his daughter. His daughter was on social media at the time. His teenage daughter also, he told her the same thing. These pants, two inches too long. I want you to trim the bottom. She didn't give him a response. So he went to his son. His son was reading some book at the time. He told his son the same thing. Pants, two inches too long. Trim, cut, cut. Then he left. And then he thought to himself, let me tell my mother. She's here with me as well. He went to his mother. His mother was watching TV at the time. And his mother was watching TV. He came to his mother and from the side, he said, I've got these pants. They're two inches too long. If you could trim two inches from the bottom, I can wear them for my business meeting tomorrow. And he felt confident that night after he ate dinner, he went to sleep confidently thinking to himself that I've told four people, one of them will take care of it. Now that night, the wife, before she went to sleep, she thought to herself that our anniversary is coming up. And if I want to get something good from my husband, then I have to make him happy. And an easy way to make him happy would be to trim his pants. So she went to the kitchen, took out the pair of scissors, cut two inches from the bottom and sewed it. At the... Then the daughter thought to herself before she went to sleep, she thought my birthday's coming up. And if I want something from dad, something nice, then I got to make him happy. She went to the kitchen, took out the scissors and cut two inches from the bottom. The son thought to himself, okay, I'm going to start school again soon. And back to school, I need a new set of clothes. And if I want to get a new set of clothes, then I need to make an investment into the emotional bank balance of dad. So he went to the kitchen, took the scissors and cut two inches from the bottom. And his mother had already gone to sleep. She was old. But then she woke up at night to use the bathroom and she thought to herself that even though he's married, he still needs his mother. Look, let me show them how I do things. So she put on her glasses in the middle of the night. She took the scissors and she cut two inches off the bottom. The next morning, when this man woke up before everyone else to catch his flight, he put on the pants and they were shorts. So this is a small story that shows us that everyone wanted to do a good job for their friend or their husband or their father or their son, but nobody knew how. Saru karvu tu, saru karta avriu ne. That's the difference. If Arjun had gone to Yudhishthir or Bhim or Nakul or Sadev or even Draupadi, everyone would have given him some guidance on how to get rid of this problem. But what would that guidance have done? Would it have actually solved the problem or just treated some of the symptoms? By going to Krishna Bhagwan. By telling the right person, he turned his vishad into vishad yog and he got a solution, a proper solution. And in that, he asks for what's good for him. Yat shreya sya nishchitam bruhitan me. In the Kathopanishad, Yam Raja, the god of death, is speaking to Nachiketa. And he tells Nachiketa that there are two paths in this world. One path is prey and the other path is shrey. Nachiketa asks, what's the difference between these two paths? Yam Raja, he says, Prey brings you to me and Shrey takes you to God. Prey is getting what you want. Shrey is getting what you need. That's the difference. If you get what you want, you go to hell. And if you get what you need, then you go to heaven. That's what Yam Raja explains to Nachiketa. Here, Arjun could have asked, Yat Prey is yan nishchitam bruhitame. Tell me what I want to hear. But he doesn't ask for that. He knows don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. And when he tells this to Krishna Bhagwan, he closes this statement with his hands folded and he says, Shishyas te hum. The word shish comes from the Sanskrit word, Sanskrit verb shas, which means to be guided. He's asking his guru for guidance. He's asking God for guidance here. He's going to imbibe that guidance. He's ready to do it. He's become a receptacle for it. So whenever we have any problems in our lives, the way we can solve that problem, our saving grace is to be like Arjun. First, accept the problem. Don't deny it. Second, go to God and Guru and ask that God and Guru, what is good for me at this time? Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. And remind them, Shishyasteham, I am open to your guidance. Now, please guide me. If we can do that, then we'll get all the benefits that Krishna Bhagwan gives to Arjun throughout the entire Mahabharata war. In discussing those benefits, we'll spend the next few lectures in this series. Until then, I pray 
that we can imbibe this sense of shishitva, become a disciple like this in our own lives. Astu. <laughs>